In today's episode of Entitled People, How to Ruin Your Life. So about 10 months ago, a guy goes down outside a strip mall store, has a medical alert bracelet on about a heart condition. Paramedics get called, which arrive quickly. They show up in a four-door pickup with bed shell, all fire engine red, flashing lights and sirens, fire department, paramedics all over the truck. They jump out and start hooking this guy up to blood pressure cuff, sticking the heart monitor pads onto him, etc. A Karen rolls up behind the paramedic truck and starts screaming that the truck cut her off at the intersection with the lights and sirens. Then she demands that the paramedic look at her as she melts down while he is starting CPR on the victim. The paramedic is obviously ignoring her entirely but has to get something from the truck. She blocks his way and gets moved aside. As he goes to the truck, this is where Karen pulls out the pepper spray, hoses the standing paramedic directly in the face, but she's not done. She sprays the second paramedic on the ground and just for the trifecta, hoses down the heart attack victim screaming he is too young to have a heart attack. I took it as my cue to remove her pepper spray and hold on to her with others until police arrived. Still others are trying to help with CPR while some try to wash the eyes of the paramedics. The police arrive, Karen goes immediately into handcuffs and then attempts to bite slash kick the police which results in getting hogtied and her shirt pulled over her face, at which time she screams the R word. And the kicker, when police arrest her, she starts with, Do you know who I am? The results of this whole situation are two counts of aggravated assault with a weapon on the paramedics and two counts of assault on the police. One count of aggravated assault with a weapon on the heart attack victim, which thankfully survived, and resisting arrest with violence. She is also being sued by the heart attack victim for $10 million, which she apparently has. Her criminal trial is coming up. I bought a new suit for it, and my old self will be there with bells on. Since the entire event is on video from two cameras and who knows how many cell phones, it will be interesting to see what her high-powered legal team is going to cook up. But ultimately, I hope she will be convicted. She will be facing a possible 65 years, but practically will only get about 10 years maximum, if any prison time at all. As a side note, her husband is a bank vice president and refused to make her bail. It took her 13 days to get her family to bail her out. Who was the jerk here? Even if she thought that the heart attack attack victim was too young to have a heart attack, why does she think that they would be faking having a heart attack? Who in their right mind would call the paramedics and then lie on the ground and pretend to be having a heart attack? Even if for some reason it wasn't a heart attack, it was something else, how could you possibly interfere in that? The paramedic is trying to go back to the truck to get something and she blocks him. That's a pretty serious thing to do because this could be a life or death situation and obviously it was because he was having a heart attack, but man, I I don't know how she has 10 million dollars and if that's even possible for them to know that that's true but he probably is going to successfully sue her for something because he could have lost his life there if she was interrupting the flow of the paramedics try to get the help that he needs while he's on the ground having a heart attack let me know what you would do if you were a bystander in this situation and is she the jerk or not a jerkish bridesmaid meets the unmovable force my mother some quick background my baby brother was born terminally ill and the long hospital stays and the expensive meds kicked in around six months old. To cope with this huge medical bill that was ongoing, my mom worked a lot of odd jobs over the years, and one of those odd jobs was custom making wedding and bridesmaid gowns. My mom had a few diehard rules. Number one, she did all of your measurements. I heard the lecture of vanity fibbing only results in poorly fitting dresses more times than I can count. And rule number two, all final fittings must be completed at least three weeks before the wedding. That way, if Dewey, her son, had an emergency hospital stay, she'd have time to arrange for someone to sit with him while she went home to finish a job. He was nonverbal and needed a constant companion. This particular bride wanted all of her bridesmaids in pastel organza dresses. Organza is a gauzy fabric. The base dresses were white covered with these colors. Unfortunately, the bride had more bridesmaids than pastel shades the fabric came in, meaning one lucky bridesmaid wore tan. The bride refused to start a fight by assigning color, so was first come, first serve. When you came for your measurements, you got to pick from the remaining colors. One bridesmaid lived three hours away and flat out refused to come to town to be measured. She insisted that telling us she was a size 8 was good enough. Bridal sizes are very different and didn't cleanly convert, so that really meant nothing. My mom finally reached the compromise that a local seamstress could measure her
her and send in the measurements. One month before this wedding, Dewey, her son, was admitted into the ICU to be placed on a ventilator. My mom now had to find enough coverage to get eight dresses finished in the next two weeks or so. She pulled it off thanks to amazing friends, but it was tight. My dad was busy working overtime to pay the bills and dealing with the other two kids, us. Well, this jerkish bridesmaid still refused to have a final fitting more than two days before the wedding. She quote, didn't want to waste a trip because my mom was a horrible seamstress who didn't understand proper sizing. I was cleaning up seed pearls during that lovely conversation. My mom begged a friend to sit with Dewey for an entire day so she could do the fitting and the adjustments all at once. The bridesmaid was two hours late. When she arrived, she saw the hideous tan dress and began literally screaming about how it wasn't fair and how my mom must have picked that color. She demanded another bridesmaid return their dress and both dresses get swapped colors. That would have been an additional 20 hours of work, so my mom laughed and told her no. The bride herself arrived and told her friend, the bridesmaid, that that color was the only option left and that she was sorry, but it was that or drop out of the wedding and pay for the dress anyway. So the bridesmaid finally agreed to put it on and yeah, she lied about her size. When the zipper didn't go all the way up, mom whipped out the measuring tape only to discover that this jerk lady had shaved one to two inches off of every measurement except her height. Her defense was that she wasn't going to let a jealous seamstress lie about her, so she fixed the numbers before passing them on. By this point, my mom was breathing fire. Her son's life hung in the balance and this lunatic was making her life hell. My mom demanded double for the dress because she was going to have to add strips to the base white dress to make it big enough and then make a whole new overdress from organza. It was doubling the time it would take to make this and adding substantially to the fabric costs. The bridesmaid fought over it and my mom finally told her, fine, pay me the agreed upon amount and take your dress as is. Now the bride herself was bullying the bridesmaid into just paying up. She finally agreed to it and my mom told the bride to get the bridesmaid out of her house. They could come back in five hours to get the dress. Thankfully, the redone dress was a perfect fit. The bridesmaid paid the remaining balance and left after that. The day that my brother died, my mom refused to make another wedding dress ever again. She's only made one in the 21 years since as a favor to the friend who spent that ill-fated day with Dewey in the ICU while my mom fought with this jerkish bridesmaid. One of the very first parts that makes no sense at all about this is why would she edit her measurements? So she did go to the seamstress, she did get the measurements, and then she said that she fixed them by shaving off one or two inches off of every measurement? I mean, this protects nothing here except for her ego, and her ego is about to be shattered when she ultimately has to wear the dress that won't fit her because she isn't one to two inches off of every measurement. So that part makes no sense at all. It's kind of like a short-term ego boost in exchange for a dose of reality when you actually have to put the dress on or have it made. And in this case, pay twice the amount that you originally thought you were going to pay and also unknowingly deprive a mother from her dying son when she would want to spend time with him instead of doing all of this. I mean, this is obviously the entitled people sub and this is a perfect example of someone that is so brutally entitled that they don't even understand what they're doing to the people around them. I was hoping that there would be maybe a happier ending, but it is sad to hear that the brother did die after all. And moments like this, the mom had to spend her time away from him when he ultimately did die. So let me know what you would do if you were in this situation and who was the biggest jerk. This is a story of entitled people and upgrading to first class. Some background. I'm an airline captain commuting to work. I purchased a full fare first class ticket to get there. I lived in Atlanta at the time, domiciled in Houston and commuted. Normally, you could get a jump seat in the cockpit, but on this auspicious day, that was already taken. Pass riding wasn't an option because there were no seats in coach and only one in first class. Pass riders can be bumped for fare paying passengers and I needed to get to work, so I plunked down my credit card and bought the last seat in first class. Boarding has occurred and I'm peacefully sitting in my seat waiting for pushback. This is how it starts. The entitled woman says, You're sitting in my seat. You'll need to move right now. Me, checking my boarding pass. Nope, this is my seat. Not gonna happen. Sorry. Entitled woman. You're an employee. You're sitting in my seat. Move now. Me, may I see your boarding pass? Clearly there's some mistake. Entitled woman. You may not see 
see my boarding pass. I showed that when I boarded. I've upgraded to first class. Now move. Me. You'll need to resolve this with the flight crew. I'm a passenger. Entitled woman stomps off, resembling an irritated Dolores Umbridge, and returns with the flight attendant. Flight attendant says, Good morning, Captain. May I see your boarding pass? Me. Sure thing. I show my boarding pass. Flight attendant. Ma'am, that's his seat. He paid for it. Entitled woman. Well, then throw him off, dear. I've upgraded a first class, and now that is my seat. Flight attendant. Um, I'll need to see your boarding pass, ma'am. Entitled woman. You will not. I showed it when I boarded. I've upgraded to first class. Flight attendant. How did you upgrade to first class? Entitled woman. I upgraded to first class. I'm more important than an employee. Now get him out of my seat. Someone has called the cockpit and the captain has left the flight deck to deal with this. Captain says, ma'am, I'm Captain Wallaby. I've just spoken with the gate agent. We certainly apologize for this awkward situation. The agent has corrected your paperwork and has a voucher for future travel for you as well. Please go fetch your new boarding pass and your voucher and we'll be on our way. The entitled woman departs up the jetway, a triumphant smile on her face. The captain returns to the flight attendant and says, prepare the doors for departure. The doors close. The captain returns to the cockpit as we push back from the gate and I can see the entitled woman pounding on the glass next to the jetway. It was a nice ride to Houston. The coffee was wonderful. Somehow, this sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen. Maybe not a successful lawsuit, but a lawsuit nonetheless, because what if this woman was trying to get to something that was extremely important and the captain basically just tricked her into getting off the plane so he could take off without her? One of the comments basically summarized what this was, and it was a tactic where you say, you win, just go get what you want, and then psych So they voluntarily get off thinking they're getting whatever they want and then they just leave. Someone else said that apparently it is much easier and less disruptive to flight schedules just to kick them off using this tactic than to bring airport security aboard the plane. So maybe she wouldn't even try suing, but this would probably make her so enraged that she would at least think about it. I mean, if she's banging on the glass as they're moving away, she's going to be pretty mad. And what if she had some carry-ons up there? She just loses her carry-ons? And one last comment to kind of make sense of this a little bit more, according to someone else in the comments, they said that there is a clause in the fine print of most boarding passes that if you leave the plane after you've already boarded, you are giving up the flight. It's for security. Oops, let me go get my backpack that I left that has my paraphernalia, I mean my children's books, but it's great for getting off people who think that the world resolves around them. And the source for this is apparently his father is a captain for American Airlines. So what would you do in this situation and who do you think was the biggest jerk? 